Good morning, everyone. In the last lesson, I left you with a cliffhanger. Mussolini had just invaded Ethiopia, or Abyssinia, as someone called it, and the great powers of France and Britain were ready to react and show Mussolini what for. So what did they do? Was it effective? What were the long-term consequences? And why should you care? Keep reading and you will find an answer to all these questions, and hopefully to the last one too. Today we'll be looking at the consequences of the invasion of Ethiopia, following, focusing on the following points. The story so far, so what happened in the previous episodes of that dumpster fire that was the League of Nations. Then we will look at the sanctions, at the whole level pact, you will see what it was, at the time when Italy decided that joining the Axis might be a good idea, spoiler alert, it wasn't, and at the lesson Hitler learned by looking at this whole situation from afar. And then, as always, I will give you a model answer. So let's dive into it, the story so far. Check the last lesson if you want more context and more detail, but here is a very quick rundown on the Ethiopian crisis so far. So, uh, Italy's fascist dictatorship wanted to look like a big boy on the international stage and decided to invade Ethiopia, the same country that had defeated the Italian army 50 years prior. It was uh, Ethiopian War Part Two. now it's personal. To launch the invasion, he needed an excuse. Mussolini needed an excuse. He found one when a confrontation between Italian and Ethiopian soldiers turned into a firefight that killed 160 people. After that, he started gathering supplies and troops on the border between Ethiopia and the Italian colony of Eritrea, despite telling everyone at the League of Nations that he was almost certainly not going to invade it to invade Ethiopia. He did exactly that, invaded Ethiopia. Meanwhile, Britain and France could have stopped the invasion by closing down the Suez Canal, which is the shortest and safest route between the Mediterranean, where Italy is, and the Red Sea, where Ethiopia is. They could have closed it, but they didn't. They could also have showed uh, slowed down Mussolini's deployment of troops by forbidding every country in the League of Nations from exporting oil and resources to Italy. They didn't. There were several reasons, uh, but the main one was simple. Mussolini's aggressive posturing made, made Italy look like a country that could help contain Hitler's expansionism, which was the most worrying thing for Britain and France. So they kept trying to appease him. Okay, keep this word in mind, appeasement, because it will come up a lot in the next term when we'll deal with the appeasement of Adolf Hitler. Now, Eventually, uh, Britain and France uh, were pressured by internal and international public opinion to put some pressure onto Italy, and they begrudgingly complied. The list of sanctions included a block of all the sale of weapons to Italy, but not to Abyssinia, a block of all the inputs from Italy towards the countries that belong to the League of Nations, and a block of all the export of military resources to Italy, for example, rubber, metals and plastic, but not oil and not steel, which are the main things you need to create a modern fighting force, essentially. It was too little, too late. The Swiss Canal had not been closed down to Italian ships, and Italy could still get much of the required strategic resources from countries that had never been part of the League of Nations, like the United States, the largest economy in the world, or from other countries that had been part of the League in the past, but which had fallen out with the institution and were now actively against it, like Japan after the Manchurian crisis and Hitler's Germany, whose entire point was make Germany strong again and get out of the entire uh, world order created by the League of Nations. Furthermore, there were also internal, re internal reasons why British and French governments did not want to implement a full economic embargo on Italy. Embargo is when you refuse to trade with a nation, with a country. First of all, the public opinion of both countries was still pacifist and believed that the situation could be settled with diplomacy rather than war. People did not want another world war, yet it was exactly what they got. The economic element uh, of uh, the sanctions was also very important, as the huge economic crisis of 1929 had made the entire world much poorer, and the British and French governments were afraid that thousands of jobs would be lost if the sanctions were thoroughly enacted. For example, a lot of uh, uh, Britain's workforce was employed in coal mines and in coal fields. If Britain stopped exporting coal to Italy, something like 3,000 people would lose the, job in the, the jobs in the north of England, for example. However, 
And the main reason why the two powers wanted to avoid dealing too harshly with Mussolini was the hope that he would still, despite everything, provide a counterweight against Hitler's aggressive revisionism of the Treaty of Versailles. The Nazis' main political point, as we said, was the complete destruction of the treaties, and also against Hitler's expansionism in Central Europe, because the other main point of Hitler was that Germany was not big enough, and therefore he had to conquer other parts of Central Europe. It was the called Lebensraum that was supposed to feed the growing population of Germany. To this end, uh, the British Foreign Secretary Hoare and the, free, uh, and the French uh, Foreign Minister Laval signed a secret deal, known very imaginatively as the Hoare-Laval Pact, which would grant two-thirds of Ethiopia, so the majority of the country's territory, to Italy, while leaving the remaining third as an independent state. It was supposed to be a secret, as all these sort of deals in which France and Britain partition the world among themselves, and they have done that a lot in the previous years. It was supposed to be a secret, but it eventually was leaked uh, to the French press, forcing both Hoare and Laval to resign. It was a huge scandal. It showed to all the small independent countries that were struggling to survive against the larger aggressive neighbours that the League would not defend them as it promised to, as it was supposed to, if defending them went against the interests of the French and the British. Meanwhile, and history is uh, has a lot of meanwhiles, as you know by now, meanwhile, by 1936, Italy had successfully completed its invasion of Ethiopia, and Italian troops, led by General Pietro Badoglio, entered the Abyssinian capital of Addis Abeba on the 5th of May, three days after the Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie had been forced to flee the country. Haile Selassie fled to Geneva, the place where the League of Nations was based, like today the United Nations, the United Nations are based in New York, the League of Nations was based in Geneva. He went, he was exiled to, he went into exile to Geneva, where he made an inflaming speech condemning the Italian use of poisonous gas. It was something that it is probably one of the worst war crimes in uh, in Italian history and possibly in world history. Gases had been uncontrovertibly and undeniably forbidden by international laws after all the psychological and physical damage they had done in World War One. In World War Two, the Nazis and the Allies and the Italians would, do, would throw it practically every sort of other weapons at each other, including atomic bombs, but not poisonous gases. They had them in case the situation required them, but luckily they never used them. So, he complained about this incredible criminal act of the Italian army, which used poisonous gases to uh, deter the resistance. And also he complained about the obvious inaction of the League of Nations, which has so far proved completely unable to stop armed aggression and wars across the globe. You can find the full text of Haile Selassie's speech linked in the transcript. So, but what did Italy think of the sanctions? The economic sanctions against the country did have an impact, but it was mostly an ideological and political one, which affected the way Mussolini's regime presented itself as the poor victim of an international conspiracy against the country. On the one hand, it stimulated a defiant reaction. Uh, Mussolini was this sort of, ah, you can try and hurt me, but I am defiant. Menefoego was one of his mottos, meaning I don't care. On the one hand, it stimulated this, it stimulated this sort of defiant reaction typical of, uh, of fascist propaganda, which sought to depict Italy as stronger than its opponent. For example, there is this beautiful picture, which I discovered today while preparing this lesson, of a child dressed as a fascist militant using uh, a roll of toilet paper with the sanctions written on it. You can find a picture in the transcript. On the other hand, the sanctions allowed Mussolini to play the part of the victim, to gather more support within Italy, since he was now able to, to victimize his regime and to blame all the problems and the poverty of the country on the sanctions imposed by the so-called Jewish plutocratic democracies, as he called them. There is this, this other picture, which is also in the transcript, which shows uh, the country of Italy being strangled by a noose labelled the sanctions. So on the other hand, you got the, ha, ah, you can sanction us as much as you want. We clean our bottoms with your sanctions. 
and on the other hand, your sanctions are so, are so bad they are strangling our countries. This is a typical fascist propaganda. The sanctions also finally gave Mussolini an excuse to leave the League in 1937, after he had spent decades essentially working to undermine its principles of collective security. Remember the Corfu incident we had described? Most importantly, Mussolini decided to stop posing as the potential counterweight to Hitler. But instead, he decided to become closer to him and to Japan, the two other powers scorned by the League. In 1936, Italy, Germany and other right-wing dictatorships like the one in Spain, I don't know if we will tackle the Spanish Civil War, but keep it in mind because it's kind of the stage tryouts, the stage trial of the of Second World War. So, Right-wing countries essentially in 1936 uh, joined the so-called Anti-Comintern Pact, an alliance against what was seen as the communist threat looming over Europe. Three years later, in 1939, Italy and Germany signed an alliance known as the Pact of Steel. They do, did have better uh, names than the Allied Pacts, because Pact of Steel is much better than the whole Laval Pact. Still, this Pact of Steel established the so-called Rome-Berlin Axis. Now, while fascist Italy and Nazi Germany were already very similar in terms of ideology and outlook, the Ethiopian crisis brought them closer to each other. Keep this in mind because this is the moment when the two sides that would later fight in World War II started to emerge. On the one hand, we got the Axis, so Nazi Germany and fascist Italy and Imperial Japan. On the other, we got the Allies, France and Britain, and later also the Soviet Union and the United States. Meanwhile, another meanwhile, I love that, Hitler was taking notes. Okay, He saw that Japan had grabbed the entirety of Manchuria, left the League of Nations, and nothing happened. Then the whole Laval Pact showed him that France and Britain feared him so much that they were willing to give up their roles as the guarantors of international peace just to keep a potential ally against him. He also took note of that. Finally, in 1936, he decided to probe the determination of France and Britain. Openly contravening, openly going against the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, he sent his troops to occupy the region of the Rhineland, which had been demilitarized since 1919. It was a strategic area located right between France and Germany. Stationing troops there was a demonstration of force by Germany, an attempt to see what would happen if he went against the treaty. To the surprise of exactly no one, nothing happened. The only major development was that France decided to lift all the sanctions against Italy because it was so afraid of another German aggression, like the one that happened in 1914. It was a key moment in history, okay? the moment Hitler realized he could get away with pretty much anything and face no consequences for his actions until it was too late. We will see in the next term how that worked out. So, as I promised, there is a model answer here, and I will read it out. So, the Ethiopian crisis of 1935-1936 had far-reaching international consequences. It showcased, once again, the inadequacy of Britain and France as the major powers of the League of Nations. It drew Italy into an alliance with Nazi Germany, and it showed Hitler, Hitler that Germany should not fear any retaliation for its unlawful behaviour. When Mussolini launched his invasion of Ethiopia, Britain and France began talking about sanctions, but it took them months to actually apply them. This was due to the fact that many British and French workers would lose their jobs if exports to Italy were reduced, and to the fact that the two powers still saw Mussolini as a potential help against Hitler's Germany. In December 1935, the French and British foreign ministers, Hoare and Laval, even drafted a proposal to give Mussolini two-thirds of Ethiopia. While it was never, never enacted, the whole Laval Pact was leaked and caused a moral outcry all over the world, showing that the League had no problem appeasing an international criminal, if that meant furthering the interest of Britain and France. When, following international pressures, the sanctions on Italy were eventually applied, they only proved successful in drawing Italy towards an alliance with Germany. Mussolini could now blame the poverty of his country on the sanctions imposed by the democratic powers, while at the same time receiving all the resources he needed for the war from Germany and Japan, two countries that had already defied and abandoned the League of Nations. This would have huge 
consequences as it led to the signing of the Rome-Berlin Axis and to the birth of the two sides that fought in the Second World War, Axis and Allies. Seeing that Mussolini had committed a fully unlawful invasion of Ethiopia without suffering any meaningful retaliation from the League, Hitler's Germany felt emboldened and began more aggressively to work towards its goal of destroying the Treaty of Versailles. The first step was the remilitarization of the Rhineland in 1936, followed by more acts of aggressive expansion in Europe between 1938 and 1939, which led directly to the Second World War. Overall, France and Britain proved unable to guide the League of Nations through the Ethiopian crisis, highlighting the weakness of an institution that was designed to protect world peace but did not have the means to do that, and was often constrained by the national interests of its leading members. So, those were the facts, that was the model answer, and I'm looking forward to read what you can write. See you next time.